Namaste, Jojo. Welcome. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Uh, oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So, Jojo, what would be the earliest memory you have of uh, maybe from childhood of either the concept or the experience of Ahimsa or, uh, or its opposite even? Many people have spoken about that their earliest memory is of violence. Oh, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So, <laughs> I mean, I think my earliest memory is <laughs> one of those kind of, I think, I think we, ha we have a tendency to remember the things that embarrass us or the things that we feel uncomfortable about. And I know that my earliest childhood memory was actually spilling my birthday meal onto my birthday dress on my third birthday um and I, so that, that's why I kind of remember but so I, I don't think that quite fits into either of those uh, those categories but um but yeah I think what might kind of resonate is is that for me the work that I've ended up doing I believe had a real um resonance throughout my childhood that came very strongly from my mother because she was uh, she still is actually, and though she's 80 now, she's a poet, a singer, and a songwriter. And her deep, deep inspiration came from nature. And whenever we used to go for walks when I was really small, she would always be pointing out to me the wildflowers and their names. And so, you know, I have this really quite a deep sense of connection to what, what, what was the um, beautiful English countryside and the you know the wildflowers and the streams and the fields from really when I was quite small so I think that that's probably that feels to me to have been an undercurrent that is is now manifesting itself um, at a much more global level with 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 what I'm doing now yeah yeah uh, looking at your surname Jojo are you of Indian descent I am indeed. Yes, my grandfather, Firoz Mehta, was actually well known for his writings on Buddhism and and uh, relig religious teachings. In fact, um, and he he's no longer with us, but he grew up in um, first Ceylon and then Bombay, obviously now Mumbai, yeah. um, and he came over here in to the UK. I think in the twenties, and he never went back permanently. He, he he then lived in the UK from then. So yeah. Okay. okay thanks. So um, uh, growing up, how did you get involved in the environmental movement, and how did that lead you to being a co-founder of the Ecoside Foundation? I think it's been an interesting journey. It's not an obvious one. It's not like I left school and worked in environmental NGOs or anything like that. As I say, I think there was this deep thread underneath of love of nature that came from my mother and her work. Um, and I think through my 20s, I, I actually had, and through 20s and 30s, really, um, I think I, you could describe me as maybe an armchair activist. So, you know, sending emails and, you know, uh, write, you know, signing petitions, that kind of thing. And there was a certain point um, that really kind of got me out of that armchair and really and, and actually in a way onto the streets in the sense that I came to this work from very on the ground activism. And mm -hmm. um, that's how I met Polly Higgins, um, who was the lawyer who co-founded this this uh, this movement, uh, this this public campaign with me. Um, and, and the moment for me was when I discovered fracking. Um, I it, it was I. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd signed petitions and been interested in the environment for a long time. But with, with fracking, I remember reading about it. And the more I read about it, the more I thought, this is crazy. How are we, you know, using this incredibly sophisticated and destructive polluting technology, you know, you know for really very, very relatively little return and so much danger to the communities and to the environment? And it was my little daughter who was then five. So this would have been... 2013 I think mm -hmm. um so about eight years ago and she heard me talking about fracking and she burst into tears and my little girl has this amazing and she still does it now if she bursts into tears her tears jump out of her eyes like this and 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 she said mommy I don't understand she said 
if they're poisoning the ground, surely they understand that they're poisoning themselves. You have to call them and you have to tell them to stop. And and I remember thinking, and I said, look, darling, I don't know how much difference it'll make if I just pick up a phone call, you know, a phone to these companies. And she said, there must be someone you can talk to. And we had been to the local elections. She'd been running around the ballot box and I was ticking my, you know, the, for the local local where green representative the, at the time. Where were, you, where were you all living at that point? We had just moved out of London and back to my hometown, actually, which is where we live now, um, which is in the Cotswolds in a beautiful part of the countryside in, in the UK, in, in West of England. And um, yeah, so she said, so she said, can't you talk to the voting man? And so I ended up having this conversation. I thought, my God, I'm being called into responsibility here. Yeah. And I made this, um, you know, I made an appointment. I went to see the local uh, parliamentarian, the MP. And everything I asked him about fracking, he dodged in that kind of classic way that certain kinds of politicians are able to do. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming out of that meeting and thinking that is never happening again. And that was the moment for me where I kind of started to really move into researching, talking, producing leaflets, you know, making legal, you know, legal um, letters, all of this kind of work that ultimately led me into the into the Stop Ecoside work. And that's how I met Polly Higgins, because she was working on fracking at the time on a case. And a mutual friend said, well, you must talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and yeah, it was one of those kindred spirit moments. <laughs> What were you doing before that? I mean, as a professionally. Professionally, I mean, it's interesting because it's quite a patchwork. Uh, I worked in the tra- I worked in the travel industry in my twenties. Um, I worked in manufacturing. In fact, I designed and manufactured computer computers when I was in my early thirties. I mean, okay. quite a different thing. Yeah. Um, and I got into design. I did a lot of design work. I did web design. I did graphic design. I did a, a little bit of toy design and clothes design. You know, um, and. But all of this, the thread through all of this was communication. Yes. And, and so it was like bringing all of these skills together um, into an area that, um, that felt really meaningful to me. Um, and I think, I think it was one of those moments where, and I'd spent several times in my life thinking, what is this leading to? Where am I going? You know, what are all these skills being pulled together for? And when it came to working with Polly and starting the, the campaign that is now becoming this, this really global movement, yeah. I, I've, I've used every single one of those skills. Mm. Yeah, it's been really some interesting. Things, some things are meant to be. Mm. It definitely feels like a, a, a vocation rather than a, a job. That's very clear. That's very clear just from reading about you and even more so now that I've met you. So... Uh, Jojo, could you walk us through the emergence of this term ecocide? Uh, Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, human violence against the rest of nature, that is something I think that we have been, uh, the global discourse has been grappling with maybe since 70s, but definitely since the Brundtland report in the late 80s. But if you could just describe how this term appeared, which was what I would say about 10, 15 years it's been around the term. Well, it, it's interesting because it's it's relatively new, but it was actually first coined in 1970. So it's interesting that you mentioned the 70s, because, of course, that's when the environmental the sort of body of environmental law started to you know grow up. Um, so it was first used in 1970 by a biologist, Arthur Goldston, who used it to describe the damage caused in Vietnam by Agent Orange. So the defoliant that was designed ultimately, I mean, he he was actually involved in the design of it, but was utterly shocked by the ultimate use to which it was put. Um, And it was first used politically on the international stage by the Swedish prime minister in 1972, who was Olof Palmer. Mm. And that was in the context of the first UN conference on the environment, which was it's which was in Stockholm in Sweden. So nearly 50 years ago now, there's a there's a Stockholm plus 50 conference coming up next year. But you're quite right. In the public arena, it is only very recently that this term has emerged. And a lot of that, I think, is credit to Polly Higgins, who I worked with, who sort of rediscovered the term. She didn't invent it in any way, but she really discovered it. And I mean, she she's she gave up her uh, sort of courtroom career to pursue this legal advocacy work. Um 
And her, her sort of moment of epiphany was kind of realizing that we needed a legal duty of care for the earth. And her question around that, you know, how do we do this, led to what became a kind of life, what, what, as it turned out, a lifelong quest because she's no longer with us. She let, uh, she departed in uh, 2019 uh, after a short cancer. But um, she first began, I think, with the rights of nature. So looking at how to, you know, give right, legal right, assign legal rights to nature, which can be done in a number of ways. And there is now a, quite a global movement around this. Yes. But what she realized, and I think this is where the ecocide term comes in, is that what she realized is that it's all very well to have a right, but it's the other side of that coin, the responsibilities that criminal law deals with. So we all have a right to life, but that is protected because there is a crime of murder. In other words, it's a crime to take a life. And so she then started to look at what could we use? You know, what, what could we say? What kind of crime could there be that would protect mother nature that would protect ecosystems and that was where the word ecocide landed in that space for her and she became then very vocal about spreading that word and and and, and having it having it grow in the public consciousness does this discourse uh, have a visibly gandhian influence in at all because gandhi's critique of modern civilization was precisely this <laughs> that it is inherently violent mm -hmm. and that it is a departure from uh, earlier forms of, of uh, approaching the question, what is it to be civilized? Uh, mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you have any, if there's any resonance with that dimension of Gandhi. I think I, absolutely in terms of the feeling of it, I think there's no question. I don't think it's necessarily been explicitly stated as part of this um, uh, kind of initiative, if you like, but it certainly um, feels very relevant. I mean, I, I always, I mean, I, I don't know if it's just attributed to him or if he actually said that, but I, I love the idea of, you know, that w what do you think of Western civilization? Well, I, that it would be a very good idea. And I, I I love that quote. It's one of my favorites. So, so but Jojo, you know, I found the original uh, in E.F. Schumacher's good work. Yes. Schumacher actually saw that film clip. And it's not what do you think of Western civilization. The question was, what do you think of modern civilization? Modern civilization. I yes. love it. Yes. And that's and brilliant. Gandhi. It's so good to know, because I remember when I read that, I was thinking that's a great quote, but I didn't know if it was genuinely the original it one. Is, it is. It's a it's a he he stepped off the ship. There was some, you know, those old style cameras around to and, and a reporter asked him this question. And I know that many people uh, definitely in India don't want to make the distinction between modern and Western and because they think it's the same. Uh, but I don't think it is the same at all. I think that's fascinating because I think that one of the big problems that we have is that um, we, we have a very, very long standing, and this is Western, separational mindset. I, I'm not sure if a, a separating mindset perhaps is the best way to say, you know, where humanity thinks of itself as, or certainly the, the, the dominant Western paradigm is that we, you know, nature is there for our, for our use. You know, we can use nature as a resource or a bank of resources. And it seems to go with this actually rather, um, totally unrealistic actually um sort of economic faith and it's and it's weird because i, I really do feel like it's a faith it's not it, you know it, it's 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 something that isn't based in you know the reality around us it's it's something that's somehow subscribed to by our, our western civilization and and that is that you know effectively we can continue to extract from nature as as if it's an infinite resource you know, rather than actually a living world of which we are an integral part. And I think for us, and this is very strong in the ecocide movement, and it's very strong with us in our narrative around it, which is that one of the things that we believe is that by bringing a law or a parameter into place that says that, you know, damaging the earth to this extent is simply not acceptable, you know, that there are consequences, has the potential 
to begin to redress that balance a little bit, to begin to say, you know, if we put, I mean, it, it, I know it sounds drastic. People sometimes say, well, wow, you know, ecocide is an international crime. That sounds like really extreme. But actually putting that beside genocide and crimes against humanity, what you're saying with that is very powerful. What you're saying is, it is just as Im important to protect the natural world and it is just as bad to damage the natural world. And if we make that equation, we start to start shifting that mindset. That's my feeling. And one of the ways that we, we sort of describe that is that what's missing is not just a crime, which is clearly missing, you know, the fact that there isn't this foundational legal piece at the present, but what's also missing is... I suppose you might call it a taboo, because if you think about it, you know, you're not going to go to a government and say, can I have a permit to kill 500 people for my new business? I mean, of course you're not. It's literally not going to cross your mind. You won't even go there. But we don't have that same feeling about the destruction of the natural world. And we should. You know, we absolutely should. Um, you know, e even if we only want to view it from a survival perspective, we should. And I think, of course, that the perspective should be far broader than that. You know, it should, it should yes, be. Yes. Um, yeah. Is there, uh, do you feel in this discourse, uh, actually, I have two questions. One is about sacredness. Uh, yeah. Because in pretty much all pre-modern societies, and that is why Gandhi's point about the modern is not a civilization. Mm -hmm. All pre-modern civilizations, by and large, uh, have notions of the sacred, including including Christianity. Yes, right. Yes. Because uh, Christianity is about fifteen hundred years older than uh, or more than modernity. So that is yes. one. You know that uh, is there within the eco side movement as it is shaped at the moment um, a space for the sacred as. Uh, something that can be invoked and the other is that within these frames of the sacred it, there was also the realistic acceptance that all life subsists on life yes so the non-violence of the pre-modern systems was never absolute right it, it because even the vegetarian is eating a living organism of course. Right. So how does that? So, you know, the many critics will say, oh, is this another form of eco-fundamentalism? And, you know, what does it mean now? You know, I can't even, uh, you know, cut a flower and bring it into my, va uh, put it in my vase. So how would, so one is the sacred issue and this, you know, how the fundamentalist <laughs> might challenge you. That's really interesting. Um, so I mean, they're, they're actually sort of slightly in slightly different areas, I suppose. Um, I think I'll, put, I'll take the bit about the, about the life feeding on life thing, actually, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, I'll start there. Um, and th there is a, there's a document that underpins the campaign, which is called the Earth Protectors Trust Fund. And, and it's it when people join the campaign uh, as members, what they're doing is they're putting funds into that into that trust fund. And it has a very specific purpose to sort of move forward the law, um, but also to you know, particularly support climate vul vulnerable countries. But it also has a purpose statement. And one of the things that it says is, is that, you know, every living creature on the planet effectively has the right to peaceful enjoyment and that any serious disruption of that peaceful enjoyment should be considered a crime. Now, we had sometimes we had questions coming in from, for example, vegans, mm -hmm. um, you know, people you know, who, who don't eat any meat or any animal products and saying that, you know, are you, you know, are you saying, is this effectively like a vegan text? You know, are you effectively saying that, you know, nothing should be, you know, nothing should be harmed? And, you know, our response to that is was actually, well, actually, if you look at nature, you know, all um, all creatures in nature, all aspects of nature have their own places within an ecosystem. Yeah. You know, nobody is going to tell the tiger not to attack an animal to eat that is what the tiger does yeah. 
you know, nobody's, you know, there are fish that, bigger fish that eat little fish. There are birds that eat insects. There are, you know, this is, you know, this is the way that nature works. Um, and effectively, when we talk about, you know, the concept of peaceful enjoyment, and this was a concept that Polly Higgins used quite a bit, and it, it resonates strongly in, um, certainly in, in UK law, and, and, um, and it will be familiar to anyone who's signed a tenancy agreement on a house because what is said in those agreements is always that it when you when you're renting a house what the landlord agrees to do is to allow you to go in, to to enjoy peacefully enjoy the property in other words your peaceful enjoyment of the property and what that means is you can do what you do in your day-to-day -day life without serious destruction and that is what she meant with that and, it, and I think that very much acknowledges what you're saying, which is that all of life has, a, has relationships to other parts of life. Sometimes those relationships are predatory. Sometimes those relationships, but they're always in balance with the ecosystem. It is only humanity that has overstepped that mark to the extent that we have done that we have actually put everything under threat. So I think that's what I would would say in re, in response to that. I think there's I think there's a strong acknowledgement that that is also what happens in nature. I think secondly, with ecocide law, we are aiming specifically at the worst crimes at the international level. That is very important um, because it, it, it means that I mean I think sometimes people ask us, for example, am I committing ecocide by driving my fossil fuel car? For example, you know if that's now. Obviously, on one level, the answer is yes, we're all contributing to, to, to that climate situation. But I think there's also, it's also very important to realize that the corporate PR machine has done a fantastic job over the last 20 or so years of making each individual somehow feel personally responsible for the climate crisis. Now, that is not to say that we don't all have responsibility. Of course we do. What we buy, what we eat, generally, and I love this about this particular context, context of the Ahimsa conversations, being conscious about all the decisions that we make is absolutely fundamental. But we also mustn't forget that we are not just consumers making choices. We are citizens who are given options. Who are we given those options by? government and industry. And effectively, I live in a very rural area, which means that I, I do have to drive a car. Um, if you know, I have children that need to get to, but you know, it's, it's not an ideal situation. But I drive a fossil fuel car, not because I want to, I don't, but because I can't afford anything else. Now, that is not a choice. That is an option. And that is what is given to me by decisions that are made at the top of government and industry and often very closely linked. And that means that effectively it's actually very important to go to the source, which is actually which is why going to the highest level of criminal law makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that's that's a very important thing to look at. So that kind of brings in the political aspect as well. And then to go back to your first question, which was about the sacred. For me, this is very much a calling. It's very much a vocation. Um, and one of the things that um, we recognize is that, of course, we, we converse with all sorts of people. You know, we have to, we, one day we may be having a meeting with politicians or government ministers. Another, we may be having a meeting with indigenous leaders. And that's the reality of, what, of our work because it, it spans everything in terms of the way we communicate. Um, but for, certainly from my, my personal perspective, Life is sacred. The earth is sacred, um, and I think that we in the in the in the West, not not necessarily, more, you know, we we have we have lost sight of that. Um, I think that um, it's one of the reasons that we allow ourselves to treat the natural world as we do, um, and I think that you don't have to. And the beauty of it is that you don't have to do very much to be able to reconnect to that. And you can see that as soon as you put children in a natural setting, as soon as they're allowed to run around on the beach or in the wood or even in the garden, you know, the natural curiosity and the natural connection that emerges from that is so clear and so, um, you know, almost sacred in its own right, you know, that, that incredible, you know, that I think, you know, it, it I mean, this is one reason that I ultimately feel very optimistic, despite everything that is going on. I kind of feel like if we just 
put our bare feet on the ground on a regular basis. And it is something I do. If this is in a way, it's my meditation. I do it every single day, you know, even if it's snowing, although it may, I might not stay so long outside of it snowing. But, um, but I always put my bare feet on the ground because I think, you know, ultimately that is our home. That is our connection. And, and the word ecocide even encapsulates that. I mean, ecocide, the etymology of ecocide is to kill one's home. And, you know, we live on this beautiful, beautiful planet. As far as we know, it's the only one in the kind of known universe that has these conditions for life. And I think we lose track of it. We get so caught up in our day to day. And often we, we can't avoid that. You know, we, we, we have to put bread on the table. You know, we, there's all sorts of things that we have to do. But, but if we have the chance to actually just kind of breathe and connect with the ground, I think it's hard to avoid yeah. starting to feel that sacredness. And I just think that's so incredibly exciting. And, and you know, sometimes I, I encounter people who are so sort of despairing. And on one level, I understand it. But on another, I just think, my God, what an incredible miracle. Here we are, these conscious, feeling, living beings in this incredible natural environment that still, you know, there's still, thankfully, a lot of it that is still in existence. You know, why would we not do everything we can to protect that situation? Yeah. Well, actually, the bigger question that immediately follows from what you just said is how are we going to do it? Uh, because I think uh, there is now, say, anybody, I think, born after 1990, 95, roughly, who mm -hmm. will be now, what, 25 years old or so, uh, knows the basics. They don't have to be educated. They've grown up. Uh, their natural bring, upbringing has made them familiar with the realities. But uh, have the structural, the, the systems that you just described, you know, which are limiting uh, the uh, options even that people have, forget real choices. Mm. Um, how are they going to shift? Now, I completely empathize and endorse the need for a law because unless something is first declared illegal, you know, it's like mm -hmm. the nuclear weapons. Okay, there's yes. no, no, no countries dismantling their stockpile, but it is a huge gain that as of January this year, yeah. at least now they are called illegal. Yes, yes. Right? I think this is really important. That's a very important step. And without that step, we can't have further uh, steps in the right direction. But in this case, I I'm now sharing with you what I despair over. That what is going to move the needle? <laughs> I think I think this is brilliant because uh, it, it actually, in a way, it identifies exactly where we feel that the ecocide law sits is precisely we almost think of it as acupunctural, um, you know, because it's like it's so precise and so strategic. And of course, we don't we don't think that making a law of ecocide will instantly fix everything. Of course not. But we do believe that it's absolutely necessary as a kind of step. So first, you've got to create the parameter beyond which it's not acceptable to go. Um, and I think that, that that has the potential to actually sort of bridge into a new approach, partly because, as I mentioned earlier, it has this possibility of kind of beginning to create a kind of taboo where we say, oh, I mustn't go there. I mean, it's interesting, actually, I was interviewed by a financial podcaster recently. And what she asked me, she kept trying to get me to, de to define exactly where is this line, you know, that so that corporations know how far they can go and no further. And I said, well, in a way, that's a kind of a nonsense. That's a, that's a regulatory way of thinking, which it's, I mean, it's understandable that they would think that way because most environmental law sits in that sphere. It's about how many toxins can I use in this particular circumstance, you know, before I cross a certain line. But we don't think that way, for example, about taking life. We don't, uh, you know, people's life. We don't say, how can I nearly murder somebody, but not quite? I mean, it's, not, it's a nonsense. You just don't think that way. And that is the potential benefit of, of, a, of a criminal law, obviously, in that way. But I think there's another issue here as well, 
which is probably uh, sort of going, I mean, in one way, a little bit uh, off piste for, for our subject, but, but, but in another way, not at all. And that is that um, I think we're, we're brought up in, 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 in much of the world, we're not really brought up to feel we have true agency. We're not really brought up to feel that we can make a difference. And sometimes people will say to me, you know, oh, what can us ordinary people do? And I was like, are you telling me I'm not an ordinary person? Of course, I'm an ordinary person and I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, we can all do a lot more than we necessarily think. Um, and I think one of the things that I mean, this is just an idea that I've been throwing out recently um, because I think it's I think it's a really interesting one. Somebody asked me, what would you suggest a government do in terms of their budget to, to, to address what you're doing? You know, what would they have to budget for? What would they have to concretely kind of invest in terms of energy and time? And I said, do you know what I would suggest? I would suggest that they supported. And this is interesting because after, you know, we've all seen through the COVID pandemic, we've seen that governments can act very fast if they want to. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But I said, what I would suggest is that they supported every sector and every educational institution to take Friday afternoons to think about how to move towards this law. In other words, how are we going to do what we do with this new parameter in place? And the reason that I said that was that we had a fascinating conversation with the brother of my, my closest colleague, and he works in um, kind of heavy infrastructure. And when he heard about ecocide law and this idea of criminalizing harming nature, he said he had this whole string of very specific questions. How will this affect the way we procure this? What about, you know, the lads who are working on that? How will we, you know, what about the approach for cement? You know, how will we do, you know, all these kind of very specific questions. And we realized, oh, my God, this guy is a gold mine. He knows exactly the right questions to ask. And actually, he's perfectly placed to start answering those questions. And of course, what it made me realize is that, you know, we are so used to having these siloed approaches to things where from the top down, we're told, you know, policy for a certain sector, you know, and, and, and it's all, you know, and, and the same is true from the ground up. So where we're, when we're educated, we're often educated into understanding our place in a hierarchy, rather than truly feeling able to contribute. And so, you know, my, my response to this was, well, what if, you know, the, the school strikers, you know, they call their movement Fridays for Future. What if we actually did that? What if we actually dedicated right across society and said, Do you know what, a five day week in the in your sort of working to earn bread for the table, it's all very well, but it doesn't give you time to actually work on solutions. What if, you know, Fridays were genuinely used for the future in every sector? You know, it could be a really cheap thing to do and a really good thing for business to get behind. And all of those solutions are just waiting to come out, you know, but from the very experts who are in those sectors and can actually expect it, you know, and, and of course, also from our children you know, as well, you know, those, those kind of inspirations of like, well, hang on a minute, why are you doing it this way? Why not try this? You know, all of those things could be really empowering. They would, they would. But Jojo, isn't one of the big barriers to implementing a lot of these ideas likely to be that uh, the, the bad way of doing it is the cheaper way of doing it? And I that, think, uh, you know, and that at the end of the day, uh, even now, uh, when we are in the 11th and three quarter hour of the crisis, uh, uh, profits trump uh, people and planet. I and think even, this is absolutely... Even in companies where they have been dedicated to the triple bottom line for 20 years, there is a hierarchy and profits are still at the top. I think that's that's absolutely going to the heart of it, because um, what's really interesting about this is that when you talk about criminal law, you start finally to trump those fiduciary duties, because at the moment, you're absolutely right. Fiduciary duties end up going uh, rough, running roughshod over everything because those companies have effectively a kind of a legal obligation to maximize profit, you know, whatever the cost. But they still have to do it 
within criminal law parameters. They are not allowed, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but they are not allowed to kill people to make those profits. And so bringing a criminal law in, in this context is very deeply important. Again, I had a, a very fascinating conversation with an insurance um, expert a few months ago. And he said, you know, I deal with these risk and governance frameworks around climate. Now, I said, look, I'm not an expert on risk and governance frameworks. He said, well, where, where do you think you would put ecocide? And I said, well, wherever you put murder. And his face just went, Oof! it was like a, he had this kind of revelation moment because he said, but that's uninsurable. And I said, yes, it's uninsurable. That's the point. You know, so the point is that once you put this rule in place, of course, it's aimed at the international level. It may not catch everything. It's not going to catch every environmental crime. But what it will do is it will have those decision makers think very carefully before they decide which projects they're going to engage in, invest in, insure, and so on. So that's really, really important. Um, and it will it will give them a kind of parameter. And, 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 and again, I'll come back to the empowering side because I love the, the, this side of it, is that actually when you put that parameter in place, you, people start to get creative. And this is one of the things I learned from being an entrepreneur, which I was, as, as I said at the beginning of this interview, because when you have a clear limitation, that's when you get really creative. The reason that we haven't removed that sort of overweening fiduciary duty thing is that we keep expecting the right results to come out of goodwill, ambition, self-regulation, which has always been a nonsense, you know, in, in industry, you know, and of course, that's all voluntary. And because it's all voluntary, it's always going to stay within the framework that's there. And what you get is you get a situation of people wanting to play the game better. And some of them really, really do want to play the game better. But if you don't change the rules, there, there's a limit to what they can do. So I was wondering, as you spoke, that one of the biggest inspirations for you then is actually right here in England, which is that when you said about murder, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as being a kind of a, a non-negotiable bottle. But, you know, it was legal. And it was possible for people to very legally and so very morally own a person and sell that person. And I don't mm -hmm. think, I never heard a single story in my history books about anyone being prosecuted for killing their own slave. Mm -hmm. So that uh, did change. It took it decades. Did. It did. Yes, exactly. I think you, you've hit the nail on the head because that's exactly what, what what's happened. And, and gosh, I realize when I say that, you know, we have so many phrases in English that are so violent. We say when somebody's getting to the center of something, we take we say you're hitting the nail on the head. It's boom, you know, and in the same way, you know, we, when, when you manage to do two things and achieve two things with one action, people call it killing two birds with one stone. I'm like, no, we should say watering two plants with one can. You know, it's like we need to, th there is so much importance around language here, I think. And I realized- I, that heard, I heard a lovely one, feeding two birds with one scone. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you're quite right. It was the same with the abolition of slavery. And it had the same kind of response, which is, oh, no, what will we do with the economy? How will the economy work if we're not allowed to trade in people? And we now look at that 150 years later or whatever, and we say, well, that's insane. Of course, you're not, you, you don't trade people. And, you know, it's not like the concept of trade is going to disappear because we can't destroy nature to do it. You know, I mean, I think there's, there's, you know, and, and there's always, I mean, this also brings up the fact that with environmental damage, there's always environmental damage of various degrees in human, in human civilization. It's impossible to avoid. But, uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I want to just pause you here that isn't there a difference between damage and cycles? So I think that probably... For example, the monsoon in Western India washes away, destroys, you know, the rush of water. It does. It damages certain things in the sense that they fall down or they break. Uh, but in its natural rhythm, it's also an act of renewal. It's not 
destruction in the way that if you and I grab an axe and go and hack the tree down. Mm, I think this is absolutely right. And I think um, at the same time, I mean, I know that most environmental law is based around at the moment is based around this balancing act uh, of sort of balancing against benefits and, 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 and damages sort of thing. However, what is not there is this kind of baseline of how do we do what we do and maintain health in the best way for all the systems that are involved involved in that. So not just the human system, but also the natural systems, because there are always compromises involved. But it's a question of how can we behave in a way that is conducive to the thriving of nature. Yeah. And I think and again, this is going off at a little bit of a tangent, but I'm hugely inspired by some of the work done by people like uh, Bill McDonough in the Cradle to Cradle, um, you know, Project Drawdown in the looking at the natural solutions. You know, there are so many ways that we can produce what we need to produce, um, either by recycling what's already there. And actually, I heard recently that apparently virtually all the rare metals we will ever need for technology are already in circulation. They're just not recuperated correctly. You know, so there's all of this attitude that can be a, a, applied across the board in terms of, of our systemic approach. And then that, that, that speaks to the kind of, you know, the, the sort of take, make, break thing that, that, you know, we have this very linear economy, you know, and I think that there's a huge place here for the circular economy, for regenerative, the whole regenerative sense. And, and, and Polly, who I worked with so closely, I mean, she, she had a wonderful little thing that she would say when people talked about sustainability. She'd go, I hate that word. She'd say, if I said to you, how's your marriage? And you said sustainable. What do you think I would think about that? I would think, my God, they're hanging on by their fingertips. You know, we, we should not be aiming for sustainable. Sustainable should be the absolute bottom baseline when nothing else is, you know, actually what we survival. should be. Yes, exactly, exactly. If you exactly. Ask someone, How are you? And this is surviving. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And, and actually, what we need to be looking at is thriving. How can we thrive? How can we thrive in harmony? And part of that is about what limits we put and what things we don't accept. You know, and I think sometimes, you know, it, there is this, there is this, um, this two sides of the coin, for example, with the rights of nature movement and the ecocide movement, they're absolutely complementary, yes. but they are two, two different aspects. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's also really super important. So to wrap up, I was wondering how you are seeing, say, the next 30 years. Uh, wow. <laughs> I mean, see, in a sense, this is the make or break. I mean, some people are saying it's just the next 10 years. Yeah. Okay. But definitely, because at current rates of growth, we are going to be 9.7 billion people by 2050. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. So even if we were to reduce consumption levels very substantially mm -hmm. and do massive recycling, um, the just the sheer logistics are mind boggling. So no, but my question is, uh, this younger people, the people, as I said, who are born in the 90s or later, they are now in another five, 10 years, they're going to be entering at least positions of middle power. Do you think that this generation is poised to make a big difference? Do you? I, and the difference what I'm talking about is, so we know there is an enormous wave of creativity that the human species is throwing up. The only question is, is it fast enough? Is it <laughs> large enough? Because, yes. you know, when we were kids, um, why did, right up till mid 90s, why was there such a wonderful confidence about the whole creative process of transformation and change? Because the, the time limit was not there, which That's came right. in by mid, I think it's the 95 report of the uh, IPCC. That mm -hmm. settled it. And then it took another 10 years to convince those in power. So it's yeah, and it's and it's still and it's still, I mean, for a lot of people, it's only it, it's it's the most recent report that just come out in August that is finally knocking on the door of the skeptics, going, Do you know what? This is absolutely stark. And I think my response to your question about this generation, this upcoming generation, and millennials and Gen Z, and you know. 
they are saying to us, what are you know, what have you done? What are you leaving us kind of thing? And, and, and quite rightly so. Um, and uh, so I, th- I have kind of interesting sort of mixed feelings. I mean, about all of this, because I think on the one hand, you're absolutely right that this this gen- when this gen- once this generation is in a position of power, it will be very different because their understanding is very different. But I also think you're right to say that do you know to actually question whether we have time to you know to wait for those like that level of action, and that for me is very much part of the reason why we're doing what we're doing with Ecoside, because you know we believe that actually a lot of people are wanting to go in the right direction, but they're currently at the moment as a, as a world we're sort of crawling, we're kind of crawling in the right direction, you know, and th- th- there are changes, but they're, 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 they're tiny, they're incremental, and actually what we need is to be sprinting and i don't think we will ever sprint unless we have a limit that says you cannot destroy nature to this extent even if every single crime isn't covered by it so i think ecocide has a pivotal role in this it's not the only role but it's a pivotal one and i think that's really important and the other thing i feel i mean i I actually met greta briefly greta thunberg in in stockholm when i was in stockholm um last year because she 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 goes every friday to the to the uh, strike that happens outside the parliament and i wanted to thank her because her foundation had supported our work and she said and she actually said i want to thank you as well for what you're doing and it was very very brief the conversation not a woman of lots of words um really amazing but what i felt was huge because what i felt was why are you having to do this you should not have to do this your generation should not have to do this and actually it is not for us at at well i mean it, it's not for our, the generations who are currently in power to sit there and applaud the youngsters for saying the right thing it is our job to act it is our job to genuinely respond to that and not be leaving it to the next generation and actually be taking action. And I think one of the things that is one of the reasons why this ecocide movement is gaining so much momentum right now is I think it is it is very much a concrete, achievable solution. There's a particular procedure that can be followed and it does not have to be led by the economic giants. And I think this is this is very important. And what's also important is that there's a mixture of climate vulnerable and forward thinking European states, for example, who are already discussing this. You know, there's a concrete achievability about it as a solution. And I think that there need to be, you know, obviously it's one, it's potentially one among many. But I honestly think it that there is now such a sense uh, across sector that there are such big changes that need to be done that people are genuinely looking for something that can be a strategic intervention. And I think that's where this movement comes in. And I really hope so, because I, I felt so moved, um, you know, and, and I do, I suppose, seeing how many young people across the world, I mean, you know, Greta's become a symbol. and I don't, I don't think she even wants to be seen that way at all as a person. She's incredibly humble. But, you know, th- there are millions of young people across the world calling us into responsibility, like my little five year old daughter did with me, yeah. you know, saying, what are you going to do? This is clearly wrong. Are you going to tell them to stop? And, and I think that that's what that's what we need to be. We need to be listening, but we need to be acting. We do not want to be waiting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's been a a real pleasure to have this conversation. I feel very honoured. Thank you.